Amen. amen and amen. Brother Chuck, I wonder if we could just have a little taste, a little taste of Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Just a little taste as we get ready for the preaching time this Lord's Day. <laughs> Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Come on, somebody help us. What is it? 491 in Amen. Amen. 491. 491. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Yes, 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 yes. You're the heart. You're the heart. I can take it for all Jesus, you're the center of my joy. One more time. Now everybody join in, would you? Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, 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 oh. oh that's good. Perfect. Comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. You're the center of my joy. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Now, almighty and gracious God, God of our mothers and of our fathers and our God. Now, O oh God, send your light and your truth. Let them lead us now so that the words which are spoken on the words which are heard may be words of the truth of your gospel for the living of our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for part four, part four in the message series, Love Is. Those of you who were with us on last week, you would have received in your insert in the bulletin the full text of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul's great love poem. It is regarded as classic literature, even. It, it's just that wonderful, the 13th chapter, and we're working our way through verses 1 through 13. Today we're looking at verses 8 through 10. You will see in your bulletins those verses listed. Now the quickest one to pull out your insert and to, to read those verses listed from 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, you will do us a great pleasure here in the church. So if you've got it, want you to read it now. Now shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, God's love never ends. Praise God, because sometimes my love is funky. <laughs> Beloved, our finest love is preschool watercolor to God's Rembrandt. A vacant lot dandelion to God's garden rose. God's love stands sequoia strong. Our best attempts may be being like weeping willows that just wave in the wind. 
What's more, beloved, is that God's love never ends. You just read it. Did you hear it with your heart? God's love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. Thank you, Paul, for teaching us, for reminding us of the many good things in this life. How many of you know that there are good things in this life that are going to come to an end? <laughs> many good things in life come to an end. Amen. I love the first lick of that freeze pop. Amen. But as soon as I lick it first on the top, I know I'm going to get to the bottom. Amen. And the experience of cool refreshment that accompanied that frozen freeze pop on my tongue at the beginning is going to end when that juice is gone from the plastic bag. And I will cut it down with some scissors to get to the bottom juice on that freeze pop. Amen? Come on, somebody. Story is told of one of the greatest Old Testament prophets' death this way. Even prophets get old. Even prophets get sick and die. Many years after taking up Elijah's mantle of ministry, Elisha is lying on his deathbed. And he is still prophesying one last time to King Josiah over Israel's future. He is still trying to shape the rise and fall of nations. What a life. Somebody say what a life. But his death itself is fairly undramatic in its playing out. 2 Kings 13 and 20 tells us, Elisha died and was buried. Elisha, the anonymous plowman who did even greater miracles than his mentor Elijah, perhaps Israel's most Famous, famous prophet, that is, Elijah, right? But no matter how great any one of us are in life, and I've been to some funerals where a whole lot of people have stood to say a little something, something. I've been to funerals that lasted all day. Come on, somebody. But no matter how great any of us are in this life, we are all, all buried just the same. When prophets die, prophecies end. The prophets teach us that. But the Bible goes on to teach, it, teach us that itself. It teaches us with a whole period of 400 years without prophets or without prophecies between the ministry of Malachi. Check it out. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. It's Malachi's work. And, and it doesn't pick up again for 400 years when, when John the Baptist begins his ministry at the beginning of the New Testament. There's a whole nother name theologians know. Me and Reggie know. Come on, somebody. For that time. It's called the intertestamental period. Now you know too. 400 years with no prophecies. But love, <laughs> it never ends. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. God's love remains. When we love as the world loves, sometimes we're informed by the same forces that inform the lady who fell in love with the opera singer. Oh yes, she hardly knew him since her only view of him was from her third floor balcony seat with only her binoculars. Come on, somebody. But she, she was convinced she could live happily ever after married to this, this man because of his great voice. She scarcely noticed that he was considerably older than her. Somebody say, uh-oh. Nor did she notice that he walked with a limp. He kind of had a gimp on. Come on, somebody. He, he, his smooth, tenor voice would take them through the rough places no matter what they were going to face. That's what she thought. And, and after a whirlwind romance and a hurry up wedding ceremony, they were off from their first night for their honeymoon. Somebody say, uh oh. Uh -oh. 
And he began to pre prepare for their first night, Brother Keith, their first night together without all their things on. Amen. And as she watched him undress, her chin dropped to her chest that night. Amen. For the first thing he did was he plucked out his glass eye, Sister Vale, and plopped it into the container on the nightstand. That was the first thing he did. He popped his eye out. <laughs> then he, 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 he pulled up his toupee and it, it was revealed that not only did he only have one eye, but his hair was failing to grow too, brother Vernon. Come on, somebody. And, and, and then before he could fully get that toupee off, and it just popped out that eye, he took off his man girdle. And then, <laughs> she found that he kind of was belly-fied, belly-fied. Come on, somebody. How many of you knew that there was a man girdle out there? Men know we can buy it. Amen. Then he yanked out his dentures. <laughs> and he unstrapped his artificial leg. And he smiled at her as he slipped off his glasses that hid his hearing aid. Come on, with somebody. Rose was falling apart. Stunned and amazed. She gazed at him and simply said, For goodness sake, my love. Sing. 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 Stop taking off those clothes. Stop it. Stop it. You're killing me. <laughs> like Fred Sanford. Y'all remember Fred Sanford? The old somebody. <laughs> Sounded to me like that couple needed a new beginning, Reverend Reggie. They needed a new beginning. Amen. Amen. It's God's love that we as Christians seek to emulate. And to exemplify, for if we try to emulate and exemplify the love of this world, we would be truly at fault. Come on, somebody. We have seen, we have seen and heard and know of the death of a language. We know of the death of a language. The Latin language is dead. I knew it was dead when I got to high school and had studied it in grammar school. Amen. I had taken Brother Bill Latin 1 and 2. I said I got a leg up on the competition in high school because I had Latin 1 and 2 in grammar school. They told me there is no Latin to take at this school. You got to start at another language because Latin is Dead. What does it mean for a language to be dead? That no culture of people, no country has it as its native tongue anymore. Languages shall cease, Paul said. We've seen them die. Okay, okay. Latin is the one we, we've seen die. So I'm grateful to report on God's love today. For God's divine love, all oh, mentioned it last week, hope you remember. I, I mentioned that his love is unselfish, agape love, and it never ends. Agape love is unselfish love, amen? It grows with time, this love of God, and it understands and it comforts you. It's comforting Sister Red right now as we meet here in worship. This love of God, it also compels, and I'm grateful that it challenges you, amen? I challenge you the best that I can. I challenge you so hard every Sunday. When I go home, I just want to pull myself into the bed, amen? I'm glad that God challenged is you too. Amen? Because he can do it ten times better than me. It hopes all things, this love of God. It believes all things, this love of God. It bears all things, this love of God. And it endures all things, this love of God. It can fill your heart with joy and meet you in your deepest valley. It can inspire and motivate you to your greatest achievements. And it can see you through your hardest times. How wide is God's love, one writer asked. Wide enough for the whole world. Yes, it is. Are you included in the world? Yes, I'm included in the world. Then you're included in God's love. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Knowing all this, we stand. We stand for now we only know in part. Mm -hmm. 
We stand to only do our part. That's right. There's so many things in this life I recognize now. Boy, when I was finishing college, y'all, I thought I was going to finish 30 million things in my life. Ask for the blessing to do it. <laughs> then I started trying to do things. And then that's when you start hitting your head up against reality. Amen? And I realize, Sister Bonnie, we might only do a few things. Amen? But... I'm going to try and do my part in everything that I do. If I do my part and you do your part, Bill does his part and Mary Ellen does her part, Tony does her part, Vernon does his part, Mel does her part, and Jill does her part. If we all do our part, then maybe something will get finished in this life. Amen. Come on, somebody. But we got to be committed to doing our part. We stand appreciating Marianne Williamson, the great spiritual writer, her great observation where she said every ending, every ending is a new beginning. <laughs> Hallelujah. But A.B., isn't that true? Every ending is a new beginning. Amen. I've never met a doctor that said to me there in the doctor's office, you know, I, I told you to lose that 20 pounds, didn't I tell you that the last time you were here? You have made no progress. And I'm going to slap you upside your head because you made no progress. No, they're sneaky at my doctor's office. They have the nurses say the next time you come in, you don't even get to the doctor. They have the nurses say, oh, you're doing very well. You lost two pounds before you got here today. <laughs> and that sounds so sweet, Sister B, that we want to hear the nurses say it again when we come the next time. Amen. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Angel. We want the nurses to say it. I don't care if that knucklehead Dr. Obina says it or not. We want the nurses to be proud of us. Sister Vell, Sister Marietta, you understand. They know what they're doing. They know exactly who they put out there to represent them. Amen? I don't want them saying to me, you just are straggling on this 20 pounds. <laughs> Amen? I don't want them to say that. Amen? I want them to be glad to see old Fofa when he gets to the office. Amen? Amen. Not have me test on everything. Amen? Amen? See, life is full of new beginnings. That's what they want to do. They want to start you on a new beginning. They start you perhaps on a new medicine. They start you on a new beginning. They say from this point forward, now you really got to be serious about this regimen. Now you've really got to be serious about the things you're doing, the things you're eating and choosing not to eat, the, thing, the ways in which you're moving. You need to start on a new beginning now. The devastation on December 12, 1973 at my house didn't end my, my, my love for my father. The devastation on that day followed me. And even though it followed me, I, I remember many times hearing my mother tell the story to someone else of the little nine-year-old boy. I wasn't big and tall with long legs like Elias Curry. Amen. At nine years old, my legs couldn't even touch the floor. Amen. But she remembers how, how frightened I was to say in her presence, well now mom, if you die, now that dad's gone, if you die, who will take care of us? She tried to console me by letting me know I would be going to live in Birmingham, Alabama, Anthony Tarver, amen, with my aunt and my uncle. And I love Birmingham, amen. I loved him with all my heart, amen. But I love to visit, amen. I love to visit. I, I love to visit now, amen. Come on, somebody. My mother was trying to comfort me. But somehow, in a clumsy way, 
with all the family coming in and all the men in my family, with all the machismo in my family, the men telling me not to cry, the men moving in my midst in my family and, and loving on me, the men moving around us in our, in, our, in our friendship circles, in the midst of all of that, as hard as that was for our family, God made a new beginning for us. A new beginning began. And God took my little family that I have now. <laughs> it used to be me and Angel on a hill in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Come on, somebody. <laughs> me and Angel, amen. <laughs> Going up the mountain to our little duplex, amen. <laughs> me and Angel, amen. <laughs> then on December 13th, 1993, 20 years later, God sent a little bundle of joy in the world and said, this new beginning you're always going to be joyful about. This new beginning may not erase your tears for that love you have that won't end for your father, but this bundle of joy will accept your love. This bundle of joy will need your love. This bundle of joy will work your love to the bone. Amen. Hallelujah. Then it didn't tell me at first, Sister Rose, she would turn 20 years old someday. Oh, come on, somebody. 20 going on 31. Amen. Maybe for you this week, and I'm coming to the close, maybe for you this week has a new beginning in it. Beloved, maybe that new beginning is waiting for you on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week ahead. But wherever that new beginning, that next new beginning is waiting for you, beloved, I want to encourage you to step into it. Amen. Don't worry about what the doctor said yesterday. I ain't going to worry about what my doctor said yesterday. Amen. Come on, somebody. Worry about what he's going to say the next time you come in. Amen. Come on, somebody. Don't skip going to the doctor. Amen. Do not fear your next new beginning. Do not fight your next new beginning. Do not fuss about your next new beginning. Pray about it. Pray about it if you don't like it. You may not like the new beginning. I went and asked them about my phone. They said, oh, well, you know, you, you, you. They, did, they didn't really want to say it out loud, Reverend Chapman. They didn't really want to say how bad I had done with putting too much stuff on it. All they said, Brother Vernon, was the only thing that's going to help you is a, is a factory redo of your home fall. Lose all your information all at once. That's it. That's all that's going to help you. Make a new beginning. I had to break down and make a new beginning. It's not the easiest thing for me, Sister Marietta. I know you don't believe me, but it's not the easiest thing for me to make a new beginning. For the great and gifted Mahatma Gandhi was right. He was right on the mark when he said, the difference between what we are doing and what we are capable of doing would solve most of the world's problems. I'd simply add to that the difference between what we are doing and what we are capable of doing in love. Oh, that would solve most of the world's problems. But in order to do something for the Lord, you got to get going on it. You got to begin. Sometimes the hardest thing is to just begin, to just get started, to just get going. Get going on your new, next new beginning, beloved. Let it begin after you leave this communion table today. Let it begin as you go forth into the world to help me beat the highways and the byways of this city and this country to find those beloved souls who will help us reach God's promised land. Look around you and look at all the beautiful souls we already are on this journey with. Some of them are here, some of them are not. Think about the ones who are not here with us. Now just imagine the ones we haven't seen yet. There's a cloud of witnesses waiting for us to make a new beginning and invite them into fellowship into fellowship here at the United Church of Montbello. Amen. Beloved, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Give you peace and keep you grounded in 
his love. I pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. And I heard the church say amen. 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 And amen.